I'll say welcome everyone to Friday afternoon at the manor and to just to welcome people one step further. I'm going to pass the, the baton over to our wonderful uh, Susan Johnson and she gets to be spotlighted right now. Over to you, Susan. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you're enjoying our series. Uh, today we get a look at Upper Canada College, uh, which has been part of Toronto's history, well, almost all of its history. We're going to find out what its effect has been and some stories from it. So please take it away. And over to you, Chris. I'm going to spotlight you for a second. And there we go. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, well, thanks for joining us today for the, the Friday Speaker Series. And I'm very pleased to welcome author James Fitzgerald, who will be talking about his uh, his first book, Old Boys, The Powerful Legacy of Upper Canada College. Uh, before we start, uh, I should share that James is part of my family. Uh, my my wife's grandfather was a brother of James's partner's grandmother. So I feel like I should say that three or four times and people <laughs> figure that one out. But um, where that puts us in the hierarchy of family relations, I, I, I'm not sure, but I, we're probably like cousins eight times removed or something. Yes. Um, this summer, actually, um, we were lucky enough to have James and our cousin Katie for a little afternoon vi visit at the cottage. And we, we sat on the dock in, in the sun and had a drink and talked about family and, and, and the pandemic. And, and obviously, because I had an author sitting there, we had to talk about writing. Um, and it was, it was only like a, it was only a couple of hours, but time really flew. And I, I could easily have fired hundreds of questions at James because each of James's, um, stories or anecdotes triggered either questions or even memories of mine from high school. And so, uh, James's novel is of particular interest to, to me and my family because I attended Upper Canada College from, uh, from from grade seven really until the end of high school and so not only was i a ucc student but my brother went uh my first cousin my father various uncles and a few other distant cousins they all wandered the hallways there as well so you know we definitely have a i definitely have a connection to certain aspects of james's book for sure uh, i just wanted to add that james is going to be joining us again in a couple of future uh, Friday speaker series events um, and that information is, is posted the schedule that is posted on the on the website so I just uh, let me say um, welcome James welcome welcome and uh, let's turn the virtual camera over to uh, to James and he can tell you some stories thanks Chris yeah, I really appreciate you giving me this amount of time to speak because this this isn't I don't think I've ever had two hours anywhere uh, with an audience to talk about this book, uh, which was 25 years ago, but it's a kind of timeless book, as you'll see when I'm going to rank do some readings for you to show you that. Um, I also I think I should say that my my three books are really um, a thematic trilogy of creative nonfiction, which means they're all true stories. Um, they're connected intimately. They're Toronto centric, um, big themes, family, school, work, love. And um, so the first one today is about Upper Canada, but Upper Canada kind of exists as a character, if you like, in all of my books. It's almost like a person because it was so influential on, on me and my father and our family, as Chris says. But um, the, the thing about all three of the books that unites them, and, it's, and I hope you will come to the other two talks as well, because it, this will all echo in on each other, um, that they're all, I've, I've chosen nonfiction because the old cliche, truth is stranger than fiction. And this has been my experience. And uh, a lot of these very strange and wonderful and marvelous and often disturbing things have happened to me in my life. And I couldn't invent them. If I was a novelist, there's no way I could have invented some of these stories. So uh, that's why I've always been a, a journalist and, and nonfiction writer. And uh, they're very novelistic, these stories, but they're all true. And 
I start by saying we hear often hear this phrase, uh, check your privilege at the door. Now in the, in the, in the environment we're in now, you know, you're a privileged white man and you must acknowledge this. <laughs> and I certainly do acknowledge this. I was born in 1950. I'm a classic baby boomer. I grew up in the post-war economic boom, uh, grew up in Forest Hill, son of a doctor. Uh, my grandfather was a doctor, an eminent doctor as well. So we weren't uh, multimillionaires but we were certainly affluent and privileged, and there's no question about that. But one of the ironies is, being from the 60s generation, uh, I always say my privilege was that I could have my cake, my, I could have my cake and eat it and spit it out. That the privilege that I had was that I could uh, walk away from them, if you like, and become an artist and examine myself and other issues. And I've, I've never been a materialist. I've never, I don't own a car. I've always been a renter. I live a quite stripped down life. And that's I, one of the ironies of, of, so that's what I see as my true privilege. Um, and uh, so I'm going to just talk, uh, I'm gonna give you in a sense of what the pre, my pre-book experience, what led to this first book and then the book itself, and then the fallout of the book, which was very powerful. It became a very controversial book when it came out in 1994. Um, what I hope to impress upon you today that the material in the book, I think, is as relevant today as it was then. And uh, part of the story is that the book was so controversial that the school refused to embrace it. And I'm sort of still a kind of a pariah or a, an outsider, which is another, which we will get to. but. Uh, which is part of the tragedy, I think. Um, so I was born in 1950 into my grandfather's house on Balmoral Avenue, which is at Avenue Road in Sinclair, just south of Upper Canada College. And uh, my grandfather was an eminent man who I knew nothing about as I was growing up, but he founded the Connaught Laboratories and was a very public spirited doctor. And um, almost a missionary kind of zeal to help the poor, to distribute vaccines to the poor for free. He made insulin for banding and vest. Uh, they wiped up diphtheria. The Kamat story is an incredible story that I will be talking about in my next talk. That's the second book, What Disturbs Our Blood. But growing up in this house, um, I didn't know, again, you're, you're a child, you don't understand the context you're in, but my father who also became an eminent doctor, a clinical immunologist, a pioneer in his field. He grew up in the same house on Balmoral in the 20s. And he was sent off to board at Upper Canada in 1926 when he was nine, which is two blocks from the school. So what I'm trying to tell you is it was a very cold British upbringing. Uh, my parent, my my parents were raised this way and we were raised this way. It was just a kind of a repeat thing. So in the 50s, it was like the 20s, or it could have been the 1890s. It was, and I'm not exaggerating here, there was no physical affection. We had a, a nanny, a couple on the third floor who took care of us, but I had no connection to them. It was a very cold, neglectful, yet privileged upbringing. So a very a strange contradiction. And uh, so this had a, I had night terrors as a child and I became very withdrawn and I didn't speak very much. I became almost semi-autistic as a child. And so I withdrew into myself and read books and I would never speak in class at Brown School. I was, I was a trembling leaf most of the time. And so I had a kind of double existence where I would go and play with my friends and I would, I would come out of myself and I would be okay. And I had that as an influence. But so when I was sent off to Upper Canada uh, on my eighth birthday, practically, uh, there was this kind of unquestioning aspect. You know, my name had been put on the waiting list. My father had gone to the school and you just did it. And I was made to think that this was going to be a fantastic experience. And initially it was actually, I, I, my first time I excelled. I did very well. Um, I was second in my class. I loved the sports. Uh, the first teacher I had was a wonderfully warm, British man named Jack Jafter, who was an RAF pilot, and was very sensitive to me, and he saw my sensitivities, and he nurtured me, and that's why I did well. And I was grateful for that influence, and um, his name was Jack, like my father, and um, unfortunately, it sort of, after that, there was no more Jack Shafters around. <laughs> it was kind of an anomaly to have him. Um, and But I appreciated the good side of Upper Canada, always did. And, but later I, I, I was starting to experience the dark side of it. So the book is trying to 
I think shows this uh, complexity. And um, so as I was growing, I really, as I say, I bought into the school in, in the 50s and early 60s. It was it hadn't really changed in decades. It was very much like my father's school. It was kind of a more British than the British. It was a warrior school. It was a cadet corps. It was very military. The monarchy was was preeminent. Prince Philip, until recently, was on the board of governors of the school. Um, more British than the British, like Northern Ireland. I mean, we had you know, cricket and Latin and a rigorous curriculum, which I uh, rose to that challenge. Uh, there was the, uh, as a typical boomer, I was fascinated with World War II because that's our distant fathers who were often alcoholics and damaged by the war were off over there. And one way to get to know them was to read all those great escape stories and World War II stories. I was just riveted to that. And so I now realized to understand my father because he didn't, my father just didn't talk to us. He was just, a, he was a ghost. He was re incredibly remote and uh, dealing with his own stuff. And uh, so at the school in loco parentis in the place of the parent, that's the British concept. And I didn't board like my father, but I walked to school. But you would see on the board, I mean, this very powerful environment of the, the gilt lettering of all the war heroes, 300 war dead from the two wars, you know, very powerful. And so I was in the cadet corps, I took it very seriously. So there was a kind of training and conditioning going on. Well, I'm gonna be an officer in the British army it's, or something like that. And, uh, and, I, I, and, I, and I, so initially took it very seriously. Uh, and then because of the accident of birth, <laughs> being born in 1950, and by the way, of course there were no girls in sight. So it was a very male world. Um, the only girl influence I had was my older sister. Um, and so all of a sudden, with the early 60s and the JFK assassination, and then around 1964, 65, as you know, the, the eruption of the counterculture. And it was almost overnight for me at around age 14, 15, 16, as I put it, it was like uh, Jimi Hendrix meets Queen Victoria. <laughs> you know, it was a remarkable and fast culture shift. And uh, I experienced this directly in my neighborhood with my peer group. And so suddenly we all stopped marching in a straight line. My group, I'm talking about my peer group now. And this is the class of 68. And I think my class was fairly unique in the history of the school because uh, just because of the confluence of historical forces. So you have the Dylan and the Beatles and the sex, drugs and rock and roll, and you grow your hair and you smoke pot and you defy authority and you do all these things, which was of course its own form of conformity when you think about it at the time, you know, we were, we're our own tribe now and this anti-authoritarian thing. and it became almost comical. I mean, I think what united us as a group was there kind of a, was a Monty Python absurdity very, very quick because you had these old Oxbridge British masters and there was a gay subculture in the school that wasn't acknowledged. And there was all kinds of fascinating streams in the school. There was a, there was a liberal people and there was conservative people. And, and, but we couldn't take this old Testament authority seriously anymore. We just couldn't believe it. It was, it was ridiculous to us. And so there was a lot of humor about that, but there was also a lot of, I think, alienation and cynicism too. We, and so you need, you need a male authority to believe it. We needed, we needed father figures. And, I, and a lot of us didn't have fathers, or abs, 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 either a tyrannical fathers, World War II guys who were really bullies ahead of friends like that, or fathers who just disappeared. And that's why I was so grateful for this Jack Shafter character. And, uh, but he, then he dis, when he left, he should have run the school. He should have become principal of Upper Canada. He would have made a co-ed overnight. But that's why he wasn't allowed to become uh, principal. So he went off to another school and made it co-ed. And uh, so the late 60s when I graduated, we have all these liberation movements and RFK and Martin Luther King, very powerful influences. And then, well, also I should say, <laughs> not until later did I realize that that was, I got the best of both worlds in a sense. I had the you know, Socratic uh, UCC classical curriculum, you know, ask questions. That was the basic, education is based on curiosity. You just ask a lot of questions and debate and discourse. There's a lot of lawyers come out of that school. You, you, you argue different positions. And this was, of course, really valuable education. Um, but the irony being, you know, as we'll come, we'll come to the irony that uh, then, then the the counterculture arises at the same time. And it was the message I was getting then was question all, everything, question all assumptions, question all authority, including this one, including the Socratic authority. And uh, so 
big influence. And then on top of that, I'm, I'm 17 years old, 1967, the summer of love and the centennial of Canada. I'm, I'm leaving the school. And I had at this point developed a case of Crohn's disease because of the intense stress on me. My family was starting to crack up and the school was changing, I was changing, and I had a very severe case of Crohn's, which I denied, like a good stoical Protestant, I just denied the pain, that was what we were being taught. You, you just suffer pain like a Spartan and you don't talk to anybody. I didn't really have any relationships with adults and nobody talked to me about my inner life. It was, so I was, it was my peer group mainly. And uh, so a series of traumas hit me very bang, bang, bang in a row where a girl I fell in love with after uh, that summer of 68, I fell in love with a girl named Sally and uh, she was killed suddenly and, and uncannily in a car accident. Her death had been predicted in a dream by another UCC old boy. That is the subject of my third book, Dreaming Sally, which I hope you will come in here. That's a whole other story. And again, filled with synchronicities and coincidences, which um, most writers will tell you happens. If you go deeply into a subject, that, that phenomenon happens. You get this remarkable sense of, of things coming to you, coming together. And that was, that's been my experience with Old Boys, What Disturbs, and Dreaming Sally. Um, remarkably dynamic stuff. And so the, the, those traumas, which obviously I overcame, I, otherwise I wouldn't be here. That was the first big trauma, Sally. Um, no response to it. My parents' school, it was, it was as if it didn't happen. You're not allowed to grieve, make it go away. Nothing happened here. This is, this is the kind of world we live in, very repressed emotionally. Um, it, it made me a writer. <laughs> and, uh, and then the second trauma was when I was at Queen's University, my roommate uh, cracked up in front of me with a paranoid schizophrenic hallucinations, and I had to commit him to the hospital. It was a very, again, very traumatizing. I loved the guy. And then right at, parallel to that, if you can believe it, not the, the ultimate trauma was, um, uh, my father, who was a very successful doctor, had his own laboratory make, uh, making medicines and a uh, professor at U of T and uh, pioneering clinical immunology at Western Hospital. He was at the peak of his success in his 50s and he cracked up. And I'm a teenager and he, uh, he made two suicide attempts. My sister saved his life. This was kept for me at the time. So as you can imagine, this is the time all by, by the time I'm 19. And somehow I got through all this. I'm not sure how I did uh, without any help at the time. I got the help later. But um, there was a lot of wisdom that came out of this too, I think. Um, I mean, it, as I say, it, it made me an author. And so at the, I think around the age of 18 or 19, I, I just, I was starting to put the dots together about my grandfather, who had sent my father to Upper Canada, and it was, it was an elitist, if you like, um, but a public service uh, man. You know, he, he really believed in public service. It wasn't about making money, it was about helping people. And he did, and saved millions of lives through insulin and so remarkable. So anyways, he was old school by sending my father to the prep, but then neglecting my father severely. My father was not fathered, and so, I just intuitively went to my mother at that time and I said, what's the story of my grandfather, Jerry Fitzgerald? Did he kill himself? Because it was, there was all this silence around my grandfather. I didn't know he had been this hero. It was all, nobody talked about my grandfather. I didn't know anything about the Connaught Laboratories. And it's not extraordinary. So I, I'm piecing it together. And she said, yeah, he did. But that was it. There was no more information. And so I just got on with my life, you know, uh, and I say, I'm, I'm, you will hear much more about this in my second talk on what disturbs I am. But this is a preamble to why I wrote about Upper Canada. So then I uh, uh, went to journalism school, even though I didn't really want to be a journalist, I, I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> and uh, that was uh, the time of Watergate and uncovering of lies and telling the truth. And of course, that was all very appealing because I was still groping in the dark. I didn't realize that there were all these family secrets and uh, 
that I, for my own health and well-being, I, I, I felt compelled to unpack. I think otherwise I would, I was going to be on the, the path of my father and grandfather. I'm the, I'm the third generation eldest son. Therefore, uh, you know, my, my, my grandfather killed himself in 1940. My father tried to kill himself in 1970, almost succeeded. Uh, and then, you know, 30 years later, I'm next. You know, I'll probably crack up when I'm, when I'm middle-aged. So um, I kind of skated around that for a long time being a young man I, my first response to all this was denial this isn't going to affect me at all and um but of course it did <laughs> i was never suicidal but i was certainly spinning my wheels in my 20s and 30s and there was a sense of only later did i realize you know here's my father and grandfather who are alpha males who reached the peak of their professions both of them and then crack up and I thought, if I become excellent, if I, if, I, if I reach for excellence, if I reach for the top, I could end up crazy or dead. And no wonder I became a kind of underachiever, you know, that I was very cautious. I, I, I worked in book publishing and did, worked on small papers after my journalism school, but I was very, people were always sort of surprised that I had so much more potential and why wasn't I, quote, a bigger character than I was. And only later did I start to unpack this. And then I think the key point that got me wrong. I was I was still I was blocked as a writer. I was having really trouble speaking and writing all of this stuff, and I was still pretty buried. And uh, one of the key influences on me for doing Old Boys was the Chicago journalist uh, Studs Terkel wrote a book in the '70s called Working, and I read it around 1982, and it was brilliant. It was just. All he did was take a tape recorder and put it in front of a person and say, talk to me about your job. So it's called working. So there's 130 people in that book. He, he interviewed everybody from bank presidents to street sweepers, to prostitutes, to hockey players. Um, and the passion and the power of the subjective, that their, their true voice, he just gave them permission to talk with no judgment. It's your reality. I want to hear it. And it was fascinating. And I read this with, it just kind of galvanized me because of my own sense of my own suppressed voice, that my own true self had been not allowed to come up because no one was listening. And I realized that uh, Suds Turkle had figured this out, that you just listen and people will tell you their stories if you give them a chance. And it can be very liberating. And, and so around this time, I had a romantic breakup. I was having trouble with relationships with women and I couldn't make relationships last. And I was puzzled by this. And um, that breakup propelled me into seeing a lay psychotherapist, not a psychiatrist. Psychiatry, which you'll see in the next talk, we'll talk about what psychiatry did to my father. He was shocked and drugged. It was malpractice, <clears throat> no question about it. Um, he was not given a chance to talk about his father. He was not able to talk about his problems. And I, I really believe they drove him to suicide and uh, suicide attempts. But he spent the last 20 years of his life alone in his apartment. He left my mother and he left, he was on lithium, just staring at a TV. He was kind of a zombie the last 20 years of his life. So this is shocking stuff. And uh, so I was determined to uh, see a non-medical person, a lay psychotherapist. Not, this is not psychoanalysis. This is just man to man in a, in a guy's house. He was a teacher originally, but he was very well trained. He's a gifted guy big 250 pound tough guy, but tender and open and had a gift. And he let me feel what I needed to feel. And I, I was dream having amazing dreams. And it, those were the seeds in the eighties that became the seeds for my, my books, which was old boys was first then, and then they all just grew out of each other. And the idea of it being oral history, you see, was key here. The stud circle was, because I hadn't yet found my voice. I was trying to find it. <laughs> So when I started the book at age 40 to doing old boys, I decided to interview as many as them as I could and apply the studs technique that just let them talk and without any comment on it and just edit it, the, the different voices. And uh, the, uh, the irony was I, my father died the week I signed the contract with my publisher for old boys. I pitched them the idea and they loved it. And I was telling my father, who, who, again, wouldn't give me the time of day. And I was trying to tell him, Dad, I'm going to be a published author. This is, this is what I want to do. 
And this was the tragedy of my father. He just couldn't take this in. It was sort of almost like a um, big deal. You know? And uh, I think a lot of artists struggle with this, uh, you know. And anyways, it's become the fodder of my art, <laughs> if you like. And, and so uh, the, the idea of the book was there were 8,000 living old boys. I was going to, of course, go interview all of the household names. Of course, I would interview, you know, um, Conrad Black and Ted Rogers and Michael Wilson and Mike Lignatiev and Robertson Davies and Peter Newman and David Thompson and Johnny. All these were the obvious ones that you want in the book that would draw people to the book. But the really interesting ones, as it turned out, were, of course, the obscure roommate or the, the scapegoated boy who was expelled or the, the so-called obscure, less well-known people were, were actually just as fascinating or even more fascinating because they were more honest, because they, they, they weren't up the power structure and they weren't necessarily media savvy. And they, they were amazed that I wanted to talk to them, that, that I wanted to hear their experience. you know. And this is one of the themes that drew out of this whole book about the, the idea of listening, you see, that I had learned from my therapist. My therapist was a deep listener. It wasn't about telling me what to do or feel or think. He was like a midwife. He let me become myself in a safe environment. And I could actually express things that I was made to feel I could never express or feel. Like that there would be serious consequences if I told people what I really thought or felt. And uh, that was almost unconsciously applied to this experience with old boys. That this is a remarkable thing. So stop being a journalist, James. Don't ask probing questions. Just sit down with them, put the tape recorder down, and listen to them. Tell me about your experience. And it worked beyond my wildest dreams. I didn't, I didn't plan this. It wasn't. It was an almost unconscious thing that my editor is going. How are you getting these people to tell you all this intimate stuff? about their lives and their and their and their fathers and the school and their education and their ambition and remarkable stuff and i said i realized that it was because i wasn't judging them and i was just listening to them and i mean priests will tell you this in the confession right that that that, that, that people will tell a stranger more intimate stuff than they will tell their own spouse or people close to them because i think this tells us something about the shaming culture like we're, we're supposed to be ashamed of certain feelings and so I didn't realize what I had cracked into when I first started. I, was, I spent two and a half years interviewing 300. We, had, we, we ended up winnowing it down, my editor and I, to 70 voices. And uh, we had to pick and choose. And it sort of, again, the serendipity and, and was remarkable in the, in the way it was like juxtaposing film strips and the way we cut them together from the 1920s to the 1990s. And you have one guy saying something, and then his classmate would, his, his, in the same year, in the same class, would have a completely different version of reality. Completely different. And there were truth in both of them. But the book, then, therefore, you have to read the book in chronological order. You shouldn't skip around because it, it ends up throwing you into this kind of kaleidoscopic experience, which I think mirrors the complexity of the school. And there's no one right answer, and there's no one right. Uh, there's a mythology to the school, but the school has an image to protect and has a, a certain, uh, they believe they have the right truth of what the school is. So the book was deeply subversive to that. It, it, it questioned. <laughs> it's actually more complex than you think it is. And, uh, and certainly didn't want uh, the very drama of my family was replayed here. That there's certain things, you know, you must be silent here. You must shut up. So, so my point is, we self-censor before we censor others. We, we censor, self-censor ourselves. And so, um, Chris mentioned earlier about the story about David Thompson. I'll tell you that that's one instructive story about the, the complexity of this environment. I, I'm the only journalist ever to interview David Thompson, who is Canada's wealthiest man. The, the Thompson family is worth twenty billion dollars and growing, and he was a third-generation Thompson and he agreed to talk to me, which is amazing because he's never talked to journalists before or since because he wanted to, he really wanted to tell me about his experiences in Upper Canada. And uh, I had a lot of admiration for him, but, it, but he was very honest. He was, I think in temperament, he was a third generation artist like me and he had inherited the family business and had all these expectations placed on him. But he was, he was in so many words saying how isolated he was 
I mean, he said, your best friend is your dog if you're lucky. He couldn't trust anybody because he thought the only reason people wanted to know him was because he had $20 billion. And he, he told this remarkable anecdote that I think sums up so much of the plight when you're so young, you don't know the world you're in. He was seven on his first day going to the school in the 1970s. And he said a little, another little seven-year-old boy pulled up beside him on his bicycle and said, my mother is thrilled that you and I are going to be in the same class because you're going to be able to help me later in life. And David Thompson told me that story. He says, I had no idea what he meant. No, of course not. He's seven. And then at age 30, he's slapping his forehead and he realizes, well, that's it. You know, it's the old boy network. You're going to, that's what the school is for, for a lot of people that you send your child there so you can get to know David Thompson and be in the network. And uh, it's an amazing story to tell me, right? I mean, there's a lot of truth to it. So that's in the book. Um, and other journalists used to call me and say, how did you get to David Thompson? We can't get to him, he's so private. And I said, I, it's just luck, it was just luck. He wanted to talk to me about this experience. And uh, so, by the way, I, I before I'm going, to take, I'm going to read you a couple of excerpts from the book that I think are very, very powerful uh, critiques. But there's one other quote I got to read that reminds me about my father that I think this this was from this is in the Dreaming Sally book. But it, I think this is such a powerful quote, and this is from a book by a guy named Nick Duffel who published a book in 1994, the same year as Old Boys. Um, and it's, but it's, he was a survivor of a British boarding school, far worse than Upper Canada. And it was called The Making of Them, The British Attitude to Children and the Boarding School System. And when I read this quote, I thought, this, this explains my father. It all came together to me and why, and why my motive for doing the book. Because my father never talked about Upper Canada. My father never talked about the war, never talked about Upper Canada, never talked about his father. <laughs> all of these very powerful things that I'm carrying on, inside me unconsciously. And so, Nick Duffel was trying to explain the double, the classic double bind that a lot of those children found them in, cells in, and that shut down my father. I mean, I have no, this explains why my father shut down. Um, so here, here, here's the, here's Nick Duffel's version of the inner life of a, of a seven-year-old being sent to a boarding school. Mommy and daddy sent me away. If they loved me, why did they send me away? But I know it's important to, to them and it costs a lot of money. If I show that I hate it, they will be disappointed. And if they are disappointed, they won't love me. So I won't show them that I hate it. If I hate it, there must be something wrong with me. Maybe that's why they sent me away. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's my father. Because he lived two blocks from the school. Why did my brilliant grandfather doing public works of enormous greatness? He's, my father's work, grandfather's work saved millions of lives. He was a saint. But he, he had this blind spot around children in the British way back then. And he, he thought in his naive way that nannies could take my father was grossly neglected as a child and uh i got a version of it not as bad but almost as bad the 60s saved me um and so there's another quote i appended onto this john le carré who just died recently he was a boy in one of these schools and he understood this and he said this is a quote from le carré the british are mad in the maiming of their privileged youth they are criminally insane Wow, <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's powerful stuff. And, and this is this is what writers do. They push they push the envelope and, and make people look at things that are disturbing. Uh, so um, Thompson, back to David Thompson. I admire him for his honesty, and and uh, I felt for him. I felt like saying, "You can walk away from it. You don't have to do what you can." You're actually, an, yeah, I felt like he was an artist at heart. He was much more interested in painting. And I felt like saying, David, walk away. I should have said it. I give you permission. You can walk away from this burden you're carrying, you know, and go away and be an artist. It's okay. But I didn't. And uh, 
he said to me, he was the only one who was astute enough of all the 300. He said, James, I see what you're doing. You're trolling through the collective unconscious of this community, this powerful group of people. And you're just catching fish and just seeing, and that's, let's just look at it. And that was quite astute. And nobody else said anything that was astute to me. Um, but he's a very isolated guy. This is, this is like Citizen Kane. It's remarkable. So I'm going to read you just a couple of readings. This, this next, this reading, I think, is one of my favorites from the book. Stephen Clarkson was a prominent political uh, economist and scientist at U of T. He wrote a biography of Trudeau, brilliant guy. He was in a class in the 50s. And you've got to remember, when I put the tape recorder down, these, these weren't essays. These people, some of these guys just spoke complete sentences and thoughts and paragraphs, really bright. And so what I'm going to read you feels like an essay, but he, I was sitting in his living room and he just did this extemporaneously off the cuff. And I think this is a brilliant insight into English Canada and our history and the role of uh, Upper Canada as a school. And uh, here it is. One can argue that Upper Canada College as the preeminent private school in English Canada has had a large impact on the country. In my judgment, it has been largely negative. As I see it, Canada's elite has been protected throughout its history by the Pax Britannica, which made it incapable even of conceiving of a threat to its own integrity. We were protected. There are thinkers who are exceptions, of course, such as the historian Stanley Ryerson, uh, who was a communist, by the way, and the UCC old boy, complex place. But Canada wasn't brought up with any consciousness of itself other than as an extension of some other society. This is key. UCC was originally set up in 1829 to perpetuate the elite. At that time, the oligarchy of the family compact which needed to protect itself against the masses internally, the Farmers' Rebellion, Mackenzie, 1837, and against the American threat, the democratic threat in the South from the Americans' War of 1812 and all that externally. The irony is that as UCC has evolved, it has really defeated its own purposes. It prepared its elite to accept a continuation of imperial dependency that has undermined its own integrity. There are a number of paradoxes in this since the new American imperial culture is less democratic and more class-ridden and polarized than the present Canadian dependency. This was said 25 years ago. It's as, as, as true today as then. The Canadian business community, but also largely the media and the academic establishments are fundamentally incapable of seeing themselves since they have always been an extension of other societies. I gather Upper Canada currently prides itself on how large a proportion of its graduates class, graduating class are accepted by American Ivy League universities. I take that to be quite in the tradition of the school although it represents a wry switch from one imperial center of the British to the other, the American. The overall impact of UCC on the country is personified in Michael Wilson, an architect of the North American Free Trade Agreement and the GST and a contemporary of mine at UCC. They were classmates. Unless he is a liar, a word he used to describe John Turner, he epitomizes someone who was very comfortable with the values of the new empire. He can take the American prescription for what is good for Canada, the way the earlier generations and the way his masters at Upper Canada would say, would have taken the British prescription for what is good for Canada. In the pathology of Canada, namely its incapacity to perceive its own interests as different from and threatened by those of its dominant partner, there is something of an historic tragedy. Canada has come to the position where the only thing it can do is tag on to the economic and political system of a declining American hegemony. I see Upper Canada College as a microcosm of the problem. 
what is the sense of community that powerful UCC old boys like Conrad Black, Ken Thompson, Ted Rogers, and John Eaton have? Is there any evidence that it is national? What would their actions have been had they gone to a school which gave them the sense of community they would have had as Frenchmen going to a French private school or Brits going to Eaton or Harrow? Although Boris Johnson went to Eaton, so that's another story. <laughs> Had influential UCC old boys absorbed a national culture, it would be more likely that their role as leading capitalists in our capitalist economy would have enhanced our capacity to cope in the world. The tremendous advances that were made in the late 19th century, the development of Massey Harris, for instance, as the prime multinational high-tech leader in an industry where Canada had some competitive advantage, were followed by our gradual sellout in the 20th century. That happened presumably largely because our business class would rather manage an American multinational than compete toe to toe. We've sold out a lot. Of, and this, this will come back when I talk to you about my grandfather in the Connaught, which was a public service lab, a Canadian idea, became a world leader. And 1989, Mulroney sold it, uh, privatized it in the globalized world. It's gone. Now we have COVID. And it was a mis massive mistake. So I'll talk about that next talk. But anyways, that isn't that amazing? I mean, that Stephen Clarkson just did that off the cuff. <laughs> and the, the book was filled with a lot of that, that stuff. Um, and then here's another one I think you'll it's relevant being a church group because this this one was by this is a sh much shorter quote. Uh, by Andrew Hutchison, who was in the same year, I think, as, as Clarkson. And he was the uh, Anglican Bishop of Montreal. And uh, I went to Montreal to see him, lovely guy. And again, I was very struck. I thought I was going to hear a lot of sanctimonious stuff, but I didn't. He was very honest and cut right through. And he did very well at the school. He, was, he, he excelled, but uh, he, here's what he said. He said, out on the street, there are more people in an obvious, this is, written, this is spoken in the early 90s, out on the street, there are more people in an obvious spiritual search than there has been since the 13th century. I see it in people rushing into concerns about native spirituality, the environment, justice, peace, all kinds of things that have never got talked about in the boardrooms. These issues now occupy 60% of the agenda. People are running in all directions in search of something. I'm not suggesting that we go back to 19th century religion, far from it. But we're going to be in a major crisis if we don't awfully soon find a way of doing something serious and intentional about spirituality. The rest is going to let you down. So a lot of what Upper Canada taught us was a lie. This is an Anglican bishop saying this. All the stuff that we thought would make life good and beautiful hasn't worked in you know, pursuit of money and status and power. But what do you do about it? It's a problem for the school and it's a problem for society. So the reason I'm reading these to you now is to, just to make the point, this in some ways this book was a gift to the school. <laughs> 25 years ago, I should have had a forum like I'm having with you. <laughs> it didn't happen for a lot of reasons, which I'll get to. Um, another very powerful reading, I hope I'm not gonna overload you here, but maybe I'm pounding home my point too much, but there were so many moving and powerful and poignant things that uh, I think I say, I say are timeless. And, and this is another one of my favorites because again, it related to my father's experience. And I realized my, my family experience wasn't an anomaly. I wasn't some kind of freak, that there were all kinds of stories like this uh, that were particular to Upper Canada College and dynastic families and expectations and the, the true self and being able to pick a career that is meaningful to you. And so uh, this one is from a, a guy named Lawrence Day who wanted to be an actor, but was a real estate agent on the way to becoming an actor, he hoped. And this is a very moving um, piece where he says, uh, one night when I was 15, I came home at about 2 a.m. He was a student at the school. 
I was going to bed when I heard a whimpering sound like a dog or an animal. I walked into our living room, which was a large open concept room with a large picture window overlooking our swimming pool. Sitting on the couch was my dad. He was crying. He was drunk to the point of not being fully conscious of anyone around him, but having that vague realization that somebody else was there as I sat down beside him. He was talking to himself in a drunken slurring way. He kept saying, I always wanted to be an archeologist. He was crying because in fact, after UCC, he had become a businessman and a fairly successful one at that. He was in a lot of pain. I remember he waved his hand across the picture windows and said, all of this means nothing. He went on and on about Thomas Leakey discovering the first Homo sapien in Africa, about how he had always wanted to spend his life digging up fossils and discovering old civilizations. As he talked, I looked out at the pool. I didn't just see the pool. I saw Upper Canada College, Branksome Hall, the Granite Club, the Badminton Racket Club, the Royal Canadian Yacht Club. For the first time in my life, I saw the school, the house, the neighborhood, and everything else completely differently. She's, she's 15. Very suddenly, I realized that none of it meant a goddamn thing. It was totally meaningless because the man who had created it had not been true to himself. From that, it's not about not achieving, it's just about being true to yourself. From that day on, I have never cared a whit for money. When my father died 20 years later, he was flat broke. You can see how I identify with this story. Because <laughs> my father was forced to be a doctor by his father. He didn't feel that he had any other choice. He was a brilliant doctor, but it wasn't what he should have been doing. He was, he was fascinated with jazz and art. And he should have been a jazz musician. He knew Duke Ellington and Count Basie. He would go see them and you know, be with them. He should have started a jazz club in Toronto. You know? uh, so he cracked up instead. Um, so, uh, I, I, that's looking at my time here. Um, Michael Ignatieff is another fascinating story. Um, as you know, he became a liberal leader. He boarded the school. Um, he understands this dilemma, at least intellectually. I know emotionally he suffered for it, but he said to me, off the cuff, the UCC culture in my time, he was class of 65, so he was three years ahead of me, right at the breaking point in the 60s. The UCC culture in my time was basically Tory, Anglican, and fantastically patrician, which is ironic given he is a patrician. He comes from uh, noble white Russian blood. His grandfather, great father was a czar for Tsar Nicholas. There was a minister for Tsar Nicholas. Um, I think anybody who was at UCC has to wrestle with the anomaly and irony of a patrician education in an egalitarian society like Canada. The contradiction is particularly flagrant. The Canadian elite must be an open, permeable elite, which is colorblind, religion blind, and gender blind. There has to be an elite that based not even on intelligence, but character which is what they always were telling us, they were building our character. They will mostly come from schools that bear no resemblance to Upper Canada College. The Canadian elite must listen to the music that is coming up from the ground. Upper Canada doesn't teach you to listen to it, but you have to, all politicians say. If the elite doesn't listen, the country is dead. And this is what we're seeing in the States. We're seeing this unraveling. The rage, the rage at the elites for not listening. And I just hope it doesn't come to Canada the way it is down there. But so the irony is, Ignatieff understood it, but he was perceived as elitist, and he lost Stephen Harper. Harper beat him because uh, he was seen as a patrician UCC old boy. <laughs> another irony. Um, one last reading, another one I think that was brilliant, um, where he said uh, he was a, a guy named John Schoenfeld who was a at the school in the 80s, and then went on to teach at the school in the 90s afterwards. And he was very idealistic. A lot of very, very decent, uh, thoughtful, 
guys that I really liked, and but they kept hitting the wall at the school. They couldn't have any influence. And um, so this man, John Schoffel, uh, he left the school in the 90s frustrated because he couldn't get any, any uh, change. And, and he went on to become a headmaster of a school in the States that made it co-ed. I know at least five or six UCC old boys uh, who, who believed passionately in co-education that couldn't get it done at UCC. So they went elsewhere and created it and did it in other schools and become very progressive schools, co-educational. That was a cent the central irony is that UCC says, we're the greatest school in the country, but we don't want girls here. We're a great diverse school, but we're only up to 50% of the population. <laughs> you know? But the idea that women can't share in this is, is it's, it's what it is. Uh, so he says, there are, Sean Schoepel says, there are many problems at UCC in, uh, in the time he was there. And there. I think these problems haven't gone away. The foremost being parental pressure on kids. I don't, in my time, it was in loco parentis with no parental involvement. Now it's, I think, helicopter parents and over parental involvement. So, we, you know, it's, the pendulum is swung. But I don't think many of the parents have a clear idea of what defines a liberal education, and I'm not quite sure the school does either. Far too many peripheral activities, extracurricular programs, and even political events are encroaching upon the ideal of a liberally educated community engaged in learning. Kids are being overwhelmed and distracted by far too many resume building activities at the expense of their academic education. Instead of joining a school paper because you love to write, you join in order to put it on your resume and impress somebody. I have seen wonderful people become victims of this mindset. The faculty, students, parents, and board need to be more honest about what they can't do. There is a false self-assurance implanted in many people, which is ultimately just a facade, so the core rots. The school's recently published aims and objective statement is trying to please everybody and thus pleases nobody. If you rigorously examine it, you realize it is 20 pages of confusing and contradictory statements full of trite pedagogical catchphrases that don't have any integral meaning or vision. UCC has never had visionary leaders until since World War II. Um, they drew in, it's a school that's trying to teach leaders, but doesn't have any good leaders. This is one of the paradoxes or visionaries. They threw in everybody's views in order to accommodate them all. For better or worse, a private school has to have a vision and to become accountable for it. UCC has been avoiding that problem. And as a result, they are creating a race of technocratic janitors and maintenance men who don't think for themselves and who don't confront themselves. He's talking specifically about the, the core, uh, the board and the, and the core administration um, who run the place. Uh, good conflict is the lifeblood of a liberal democracy and the school is resisting these challenges, issues and conflicts. Among other things, a liberal education should prepare one to live a meaningful life, a life. and of course it should be co-ed. I honestly think that UCC's continued attempts to accommodate all segments of their, of their constituency will ultimately finish the place. That's what Clarkson said about the country. Again, really interesting, challenging intellectual stuff that the school taught us. He's, he was taught at the school. And so the anger and frustration is that it is not, the, the, the debate is never engaged. <laughs> And this was manifested in my book. So the book, as I said, here, here you go. And Jack Shafter, my history teacher, saying this should be on the gray loom, and it isn't. And then, and then only the resistance of the book, we're gonna talk about that, this part now. I don't want, I'm, I'm running out of time. The, um, uh, only did I realize, this is where another complex element of the story, my editors and I were puzzled by the lack of reception of it. I mean, it was controversial, yes, but it was buried. It was it was wasn't kill the messenger. It was ignore the messenger, and I, it came back to me that the principal at the time, Doug Blakey, actually said, "Ignore this book, and it will go away." <laughs> so now here's where it gets more problematic: the sexual element of the book. You see, there were stories in the book 
where some four or five of the guys I was speaking to told stories of boarding house sexuality and seductions and uh, one teacher uh, making, uh, molesting another boy, very quiet stories sort of buried in the book. Um, when I was interviewed on CBC by Ian Brown, who was a, was, a, was a boarding school guy himself, in my naivete, I thought people were gonna engage this material, but they didn't. Everybody ignored it, didn't wanna go there, too powerful. Um, the whole theme of male vulnerability and emotional vulnerability, sexual vulnerability, boys and men, um, taboo subject. You know, it's, it was, it's about getting rid of your vulnerability. That's really what it was about. And so if you showed any vulnerability, uh, certainly in my time, you were attacked. Uh, so that's what the book was challenging, certainly. And uh, now as it turned out, I didn't know this at the time. I didn't, I wasn't setting out to sort of expose a ring of pedophiles in Africa at the college. That wasn't, I didn't think that it was as bad as it turned out to be. I didn't realize that it was actually endemic, that there were un, dozens and dozens and dozens of boys, multiple teachers. You may know the story that eventually three, the book was a catalyst that opened up, gave permission for other people to come forward. The book was just a very mild skimming of the surface. All of a sudden boys came forward and there were police and charges and three teachers were charged and it was ultimately a class action suit, multiple millions of dollars. Uh, the school had to pay, but was kept out of the media. The judge, it was a, 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 a lot of people don't know that it was a, a publication ban on that, but the school had to sell a lot of its group of seven paintings and had to pay off multiple millions of dollars to these, to these victims. And so I didn't anticipate that, honestly, when the book came out. So that, but that explained why they had to bury it. They were terrified of other things coming out. They were sitting on time bombs. They had paid, you know, uh, money, uh, hush money to victims and so on. And they had, the reason they were successfully sued was they knew that the, 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 the crimes were brought to their attention. They covered them up and as they say, pass the trash. They, they, they moved the teachers to other schools where they re-offended. Um, this is not a phenomenon unique to Upper Canada, you know, the Catholic Church, all the churches and Maple Leaf Gardens and Mount Cashel. It's a, the last 20 years, this has been all revealed. But back in 1994, this was pretty shocking. And um, the unfortunate thing was it kind of deflected away from all the issues that I've just read you, this, the Clarksons and the Schopels and the thoughtful guys who had very, very penetrating critiques, but out of a love of the school. Like they wanted to change. It was an important institution to them. The sexual abuse scandal kind of swamped everything else. This became the focus and the legal cases. And uh, that was unfortunate, but that had to be dealt with too. I mean, that, that had to be flushed out. But then you see, then I become the pariah. You see that I am now the guy with an agenda and an ax to grind and all of this, right? And uh, so to this day, I'm still, I don't exist. And then actually that's fine with me because there's still, I, People like to think, well, that was all then that's happened now. I could just tell you, I still get phone calls. There's still stories that come to me. The school really didn't learn its lesson. There wasn't really a sense of reconciliation or, or they didn't suffer any real sense of guilt or, or, or uh, forgiveness or reparation or uh, that didn't really happen. They, they spun it. And uh, there are a lot of people Upper Canada who don't even know it happened. It's, it's a form of amnesia. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a, as the Anglican Bishop of Montreal says, it's a problem for the school and it's a problem for society <laughs> that these, the leaders should set an example of how to deal with these things. And uh, so, um, by the way, two, two of the headmasters who I interviewed, they didn't get in the book for, I was hoping to have a second volume with the teachers, but I was impressed with them because they, they realized they had made the mistakes. There was a headmaster of the, of the upper school, Pat Johnson and the prep. They were directly involved in the cover-ups and they knew it had happened and they, they uh, gave a letter of references to the pedophiles and sent them on their way. And they felt terrible about it. They both cracked up. They both had nervous breakdowns. They weren't psychopaths. Uh, they had a conscience. And when I interviewed them, uh, one of them couldn't bear it and sent me out the door. But the other guy told me, he died right after the book came out. And he had sent one of the teachers off to Appleby and where he reoffended. And I know he felt terrible about it. 
And that interview became a piece of evidence for the class action suit that the school knew and covered up. And, and so I was certainly an influence on that. Um, that's again, the complexity of the school. It wasn't as if they were all like this. There's some very decent uh, people who wanted to do the right thing, but the headmasters were caught in a trap there, the pleasing there, the masters, they, the, the, their masters, if you like. Um, so I'll just end with, there's a lot more material I could say. I have a lot more to say, but the last story I'll tell you, which brings us up to the present in a way, um, tells us again the, the complexity and paradoxes of this story. It just never ceases to amaze me. Uh, I interviewed um, a man named Peter Doglish, uh, a class of 75, so he was seven years behind me. And I interviewed him and deeply impressed by him. I thought he represented everything that was progressive and brilliant about the school because there's kind of two streams in the school, no more than two streams, but there were two big, uh, in his time especially, of the, the, like my grandfather, the public service people. Uh, that, you know, that was the original meaning of public school in Britain, you, that your noblesse oblige, the elites are obliged to give back to the poor. And there's a class system, but this is the deal, we help the public good, which has been eroded, as we know, uh, over the years. And, so Douglas represented that principle and he recognizes his privileges and his uh, advantages. And he was dedicated with missionary zeal to helping the poor. He, so he was, and he started, he said, it started Upper Canada. This was planted in his brain. That's what we're here for. This is what we're to do. This is not about making a lot of money and going to Bay Street and being selfish. This is, uh, so his, his interview is in the book was quite, I remember being galvanized by it. He's the kind of guy, he was a lawyer by training, but he stopped practicing law and he founded Street Kids International to help kids internationally. It became a very powerful organization and did an enormous amount of good, there's no question. And uh, when I was listening to him, he's the kind of guy, very charismatic, uh, very motivational. By the end of my interview, I wanted to get up and rush off to Ethiopia and help the poor. I mean, it was just, he has that kind of influence on people. and. Uh, he, his, he said his ambition at that time in the early 90s was to go back to Upper Canada, become a teacher, maybe even principal, and transform the school into this kind of school. And I thought, well, good luck. You're up against some pretty powerful forces there. And, uh, but he represented a, a real intellectual tradition of the school. And um, so he did that. He did go after our interview. He, he, he said in his interview that when he was when he spoke at the school before he became a teacher, but when he became a teacher too, he would go into the prayer hall every morning and he would, he would confront the kids. He'd say, you know, you can't drive to school in a Jaguar and then call yourself an environmentalist. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like eh, you know, and, and it was sort of falling on deaf ears. He would get, a few people would be swept up and, and he would make a few converts, but not certainly not the majority. So I always would tout, whenever I, anybody talked to me about the book, I would often talk about Doglish. I thought he was exemplary. Um, and then here we go with the tragedy of the school. So here he is, uh, uh, he leaves the school in 2002 as a teacher. And I thought, I didn't know why he left. I thought, did he hit the wall like so many have, like the, the, the good ones that hit the wall? And uh, there aren't listening. <laughs> and he went to Nepal to continue his humanitarian work, very big internationally, the UN, and, uh, big influence. And then as you may have heard last year, he was uh, charged, arrested and convicted for molesting two boys. And he's, he's now serving a nine year sentence in Nepal. And when he was, I was just shocked like a lot of people. A lot of people think he's innocent, but I, I have a lot of information that uh, makes me doubt that, but I, we'll see. The the um, remarkable thing is uh, he told the Globe and Mail when he was arrested that he had been abused in the prep boarding school when he was 11 and that's why he felt compelled to act this out. He didn't tell me that when I interviewed him. <laughs> Other, others did. So then he retracted the statement. Uh, so 
but he was convicted in, in Nepal. If he had been convicted in Canada, he would have gotten a far less sentence. Our, our sentences here is much more lenient. He would have done maybe three years, like one of the UCC teachers did three years. So again, painful stuff because uh, and complex stuff. And and so what I'm trying to say is the problems really haven't gone away with the with the, the school. They're still very much in a kind of circle the wagons uh, mentality as much as they do their good works and so on. Uh, there's, there's a set of attitudes that are, I think are intractable. And uh, um, so I'm not, and, and because of, I said, this is the irony, I'm grateful to talk to you about this today because you can see it's, it's a passionate subject for myself, but the irony being, even if say tomorrow, Upper Canada invited me up to have, if they suddenly saw the light and saw, let's have a forum, let's, let's deal with all these, not necessarily even the book, but just open up these things. Uh, they, we wouldn't be able to do it because there are also there's pending, there's, there's still pending criminal stuff going on. It's still going on. There's still, there's still stuff that under the radar that is highly problematic and that we, we can't go there. <laughs> So I could talk to you. It's, it's, it's wonderful for you to listen to this. <laughs> I feel heard. <laughs> but I, I probably will go to my grave. Uh, uh, although I, might, I shouldn't say that. You know, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because the Berlin Wall fell overnight. <laughs> and, and we're in the, the times we're living in now are so unpredictable and with COVID and and Trump and, and, and there's so much change going on and it's so unpredictable and there's paradigm shifts and things are shifting and education is shifting and health is shifting. So who knows, there, 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 something may come out of all this that's very positive. And uh, I hope I live to see it, I'm, I'm 70 years old. <laughs> and uh, I, have, I have watched tons more notes and stuff, but I'm, I'm aware of the time and I want, I would love to hear any uh, questions and have a conversation at this point. So, uh, thank you for listening, as they say. James, that's been amazing, absolutely amazing. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I, could, I could ask questions for, for a long time, but let's, let's invite other people who are in the call, if you want to unmute yourselves and uh, we'll, maybe I'll jump in one, one at a time. But, um, if you if you turn your, your your camera back on, that's probably the easier pathway, and uh, and just old fashioned way, lift your hand up, and that way I know you want to speak. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Chris, over to Chris. Okay. Well, I guess I can't remember if we talked about this in the summer. I, did you ever consider writing it, trying to write a sequel to this one, even if you were kind of persona non grata within the actual yeah yeah it, it, that's a good question that's a good question because i have so much material since the book i mean there's a book within a book within a book right like i was giving you a kind of summary right so that's that's a very good question i mean i'm 70 i have this my next book is maybe made into a documentary or pitching it to cbc right now so like a lot of irons in the fire but that that's a very good it has been at the back of my mind it would be a lot of work but to summarize everything right would be great. It would be again a gift, I think. And um, and you see, that's when when my book was lawyered. You know, there's the whole thing about libel, and you know, this is what silences a lot of people. You don't want to offend the rich and the powerful, but you're defended by the truth. You know, that's a legal principle. And I was not sued because everything in the book was true. It was. It wasn't. You know, my lawyer said, "Well, you got to be careful." Some people were so angry that they did libel and slander some teachers that they hated. There's a lot of sadistic teachers in, in my time. And so we, when I went back and editing the book, we would invite them to kind of tone down their language. You know, you might get sued. And um, so that's what I think makes people think twice about taking on a place like Upper Canada. But I realized I had nothing to lose. That I had the truth, the truth protects you. Yeah, but I, yeah, that's a very good question. I, I may, I may, who knows? Yeah. Before I jump in, does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. So uh, as, I, as I hear you talk, again, a lot of ideas float here and there. You remind me of Dickens. You remind me of, there was a recent, uh, I'm not sure, it might have been BBC film about the life of Tolkien in, in, the, uh, 
in the prep boys schools of England. But what, as you as you were talking about Toronto, my thought yes. turned to what about Montreal? I mean, Montreal, as you know, ha historically had the the wealth, the, the super yes. wealth uh, of Canada. Yeah. And it isn't yes. until the 60s, 70s that it all moved to Toronto. So my, my assumption would be that there must have been a profound rivalry between Upper Canada and, and the upper and the private uh, boys schools of, of, of Montreal, because mm -hmm. they would have mm -hmm. a lot more zeros after their name than some of the other people <laughs> than the Toronto families. So it is, like, when you think of, of, of Burks and you think of uh, Ogilvy's and uh, the list goes on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's Lower Canada College in Montreal, right? Oh, I didn't know, but okay, right. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, right, yes. okay, right. That would make sense, yes, yes because it's yes. called Lower Canada. And of course, we, we looked down on them, didn't we? Yes, I mean, we we're did. upper, they're lower. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it, okay. And, and yet, the, the, the Quebec thing is fascinating, because there were a few Quebecois in my book, and like, why did you come to English Canada? They, they, they this integration idea, you see, because the yes. school right now is, you said overwhelmingly white and wasp in my time, but now it's half, yeah. Gone wasp, you know, very Asian. Very but diverse, yeah. a teacher I know who's at the school is very cynical about this. He says it's a cultural laundering facility. They're turning everybody into Harvard lawyers. I mean, the, the same is the technocracy and it's integrating people into the system rather than the, the, the new people changing the system. The system changes them or launders them. That was his view. No. Yeah, think, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. I think, I think Marianne has a question. Yeah. Marianne. So James, you mentioned um, very briefly Branksom Hall yes. and Chris's, uh, I believe Chris can chime in here, but his mom went to Branksom and there's a whole yes. series of private girls schools as well. And I'm wondering about your family and what was their experience at the private girls schools? That's a very good question. Yeah, my grandmother married to the public health doctor, Edna. She came from Wealth from London, Ontario, and she boarded at Havergal in the 1890s. And she was a bit of a snob, I'm afraid to say. She died when I was seven. Her, it was her seed money that got the Connaught Labs going. So she did not go to university. She was the classic Chatelaine, you know, took, supported her husband, and her money was very important. He didn't have money, and she did. And so that class aspect was fascinating. Um, my, my, uh, her daughter, my Aunt Molly, went to Havergal. My sister went to BSS. So uh, that was the sort of parallel universe, right? Like it was sort of, that was the, my experience, especially in the 60s, was girls were over there, right? And the, 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 the lack of mingling, is kind of, that's one of my themes was I think I, I, I had particularly suffered from this, that this. I thought this was a great, I think it retarded my own emotional growth and the, we needed, needed a female grounding influence and, and peer group. And uh, so my third book, Dreaming Sally, is about more in this field because she went to Branksome, right? And she was the one girl I knew uh, at Lake Simcoe in the summertime when I was younger, when I was 11, 10, 11, 12. And I used to play with her, she's a tomboy, uh, pre-puberty, and we'd play in the sandbar. And, I, and that's how I grew to love Sally. And she was the girl that was killed tragically when she was 18. And so Branksom becomes a character in Dreaming Sally, the Branksom culture. And that 68 was the year she graduated. And that's the year of, of second wave feminism bursting out, 1968, right? So you get these really interesting influences of up to that point, our grandmother's values dominated, right? That's those schools. And now all of a sudden they went through the same shift, Branksom and Havergal. And you know, now it's okay to be a lawyer and a doctor. You don't have to marry a UCC old boy, right? Like it's not, that was, those were the class pressures in that world then, right? And my sister was kind of conditioned that way. Then she rebelled from that. She didn't do that. Um, although one of her boyfriends was UCC, but it's, it's, it's not, I don't want to portray this as, because I know you're married to a UCC old boy, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's not, <laughs> this is not about, uh, I'm not trying to pathologize any of this, you know, um, but I, I try to point to the, there's, there is a kind of, I'm sure you've seen The Crown, right? The, the series The Crown, have you seen that? Yeah, that that's really the apex, right? Like the, 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 it all comes down from that hierarchy, that, that those values, right? That, and all those shows that we're watching now, 
like Bridgerton and who you marry and social control. And that's what we're talking about. That it wasn't that long ago. Those forces were so powerful, mm. so powerful. And I just want to add that our, um, the next generation in Chris's family, uh, the, yeah. the, the two brothers and, and his cousin, we are all uh, three educators, public school educators, yes, and yeah. three who work in nonprofit, and all of the grandkids go to public school. Yeah. So we really shut that down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more yeah. because, uh, you know, it's just, it's a very expensive um, Absolutely. path to yeah. follow. But it's, yeah. I just find it so interesting that what your family, what you're describing, I'm hearing. Uh, echoes of Chris's family all the way through that. And then you get this next generation and, and we are just so yeah. different. Yes. Although I, I love it. Downton James Abbey, all of it, I love it all. Yes, James I was gonna say, yeah, so, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say that I, like I really, I enjoyed my time there. Um, yeah. Didn't have any problems, but I, um, based on your stories too, like I, I chose the career path, maybe similar to yours in the sense that I, I I chose a career path where I can't, I can't um, make a phone call and use the old boy network. <laughs> yes. To, yes. Yes. Like, like I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a doctor where where they all know each other. So I, I have no complaints. Like I, I had a good time yeah. and I guess I have positive yeah, yeah. memories. But I, yeah, I'm quite. And it's funny. My two best friends from Upper Canada, the uh -huh. ones that I'm kind of most in touch with, they're both public school teachers as well. So you know, you find. Yeah. That's you right. find the people that you that you can relate to or that you absolutely right with. and so it, I think it, that's right that's right you know you know it's a fascinating thing like when I went to Queens which is another Ivy League you know elite school I was 18 and again it was the 60s you know I met a guy in residence who was in my English class who was in a sense my opposite but Polish Catholic working class from Scarborough, quarterback of the football team. I read about him in Creaming Sally, you know, integrated, funny, girls loved him, guys loved him, down to earth. And we became friends, unusually, we became friends. We, but I, I, that's when I became aware that I would in some ways had been brainwashed to think that my education was superior to his. He had a perfectly good, he was brilliant. He was literate. He had a good education in a public school, you know. <laughs> And that's when the, the, the scale started to drop a bit. You know, again, it was because of the times too, that wait a minute, it was some kind of, it was never explicitly told to me, but a lot of them come out of that school kind of strutting out there with this kind of inflated self-confidence of superiority, right? And uh, entitlement, not all of them, but you know, Chris, obviously not, thank God. But the bubble burst then, you know, my friend, Mark, you know, uh, I, I, I was kind of amazed that he was my friend, you know, because the way I felt about myself, I didn't feel at all self-confident. <laughs> and uh, he's a friend to this day, 50 years later. And so, and my partner, Katie, is, comes from an immigrant family that came over after the war with practically nothing, working class, starting from nothing and building herself up wonderfully. And so, I've been drawn to those people, you know, the, the more authentic. It's not to not to not to uh, glamorize them at all. They're not perfect. Everybody has problems, but there was something about just much more emotional availability or honesty or something or directness that I craved, you know. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So, and Chris, I got it. So, so, so James, just to comment, but you mentioned about the the sense of entitlement, but uh, wealth for wealth. Okay, so let me uh, throw this out there. So I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Toronto, and I grew up middle class, by the way, in a, in a, in a three-bedroom bungalow with one bathroom. And yeah. so uh, arriving at uh, Timothy Eaton, where the people had houses that my house would have fit inside, was, it was a whole cultural leap for me. But my, um, my, my po more point is the Rotary Club of Toronto has been around for over 100 years, and certainly some members of the Rotary Club would have come from that environment. But what, what, what inspired me when I walked into those meetings was not just people of wealth, but people in general who wanted to give back. Yes. And, and I think that's the part I think you were wanting to see at Upper Canada. And you, was, was there must, I mean, I just think there must have been some people who wanted to do that, 
but maybe there was less less in numbers. But what was your experience of that at Upper Canada? Yeah, um, I didn't see it a lot directly. This this was yeah. sort of a lot of these attitudes were by osmosis, right? Like right, this right. is what's powerful about it because you're still a kid and you're still figuring things out and. For sure. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know my own family story. You see, this is the paradox that my my family story, which we'll talk about next time, embodies all these issues. So philanthropy, especially. And so here, my grandfather is the benefactor of the Gooderum family, Gooderum and Wart's family fortune. They were the Rockefellers of Canada back then, World War One. Really? They were, the, they really? were the first billionaire. They, they, they own so much stuff and they, they, you know, railroads and hotels and the Gooderum and Wart's distillery. And he was a public health advocate. Colonel Albert Goodrum gave my grandfather as a gift money to launch the uh, Cannot Laboratories lab up at uh, the farm up at Duffer and Steels when the when the lab was starting to go. And uh, and then the Rockefellers came in when when insulin was discovered. My grandfather's wiping up diphtheria, and Canada suddenly punching above its weight and is now getting world attention because of insulin. The Rockefellers are going. What are these backwoodsmen doing up in Toronto? <laughs> Why are they ahead of us? Why are they wiping out diphtheria ahead of us? And so they dropped, he gave a 1.2 million to my grandfather, the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, and we'll talk about this next time, but that's a lot of money then. I'd be like 50 million now. And they built the School of Hygiene on College Street, which is now the Fitzgerald Building. And so that's a whole other story. I wasn't aware of any of this, you see, as a child. And so I was aware of rich people in Upper Canada because I would walk to school up on Vegan Road and our house was a third or a quarter of the size you're talking about you could fit your house in. Yes. Somebody. Same, yes. same with me, believe it or not. Right. I always thought we were relatively poor, which is absurd because right. right. we were in the top 5% all of the country. But I would go up the street and see these mansions just three block, two blocks north up by Upper Canada. Ted Rogers' house and the Edens and the Bassets, massive places. You know, multi multi millionaires. We weren't millionaires, you know. Right. Uh, and and so that sense of proportion, like Gulliver's Travels, like it's it's amazing, isn't it? When you're a kid, you're happy you're trying to figure this out. Where do I fit in the hierarchy here? Uh, so I was certainly aware of the wealth, and uh, and there were there were kids like the Molsons. Um, mm. That was another tragic story. But quickly, Michael, there's a there's an amazing uh, anecdote in the book. When I interviewed Andrew Ignatieff, who is Michael Ignatieff's younger brother, class of 69, incredibly powerful. Again, that wasn't touched. That was a, such a, if you read that in the book, it's, it again, says so much about here, you have an Ignatieff and a Molson, iconic Canadian names, right? Mm. And they're teenage boys in that house. And I knew the Molsons, his, his brother was in my class. And their, their family imploded just like mine. Their father killed himself. The mother had been sleeping around. Terrible, terrible. The boys were put into boarding. The teenage 16-year-old Peter Molson mm. unravels in front of Andrew Ignatieff. And mm. the school is doing nothing. Again, no response. Nobody there. No counselors. You're just left alone. And so he goes across the street to Kilberry into the basement of a friend of mine's and shoots himself at 16. Mm. And the brother from my class kills himself. So three, three of them are wiped out. And Ignatieff, when I interviewed him, was still carrying this all these years. It was Andrew Ignatieff. And he, and, he, and he just let it rip in my book. Mm. In my Very powerful story. And this is what betrayal of the institution. You see, there's apparently there's an institute of institutional courage that's been launched recently about we got to stop this pattern of throwing people over the side. Right. You know, right. That be, because it, it, the whole thing about the donor class, you know, mm -hmm. that you don't offend the donor class. Well, they, they're willing to sacrifice the children of these families. Mm -hmm. And then nobody knows, you see, that the story becomes buried. And it's, and, and I'm, I'm arguing it's still buried. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I just told you it, but you're in a very small number, a handful of people who know this story. And it demands a response of some kind, you know. Well, what what and, you're describing uh, reminds me of the, the tale of Dead Poet Society. Yes. Where, where, oh, the one, where the one boy, he wanted to not be uh, upper established, he wanted to be an actor. And then he, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, he commits suicide. He, he does, he does, yeah. And uh, which, uh, there must, it sounds like there was elements of that story at Upper no. Canada. But, uh, 
Again yes, and again. I, yeah. yeah, I said I uncovered that again. It was unconscious material because my own family. Yes. I had to sort of. I was trying to separate my family. I was the danger of projecting my story on everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. so I had to be more objective about it. But as I was doing my research, these stories it was uncanny how many of them were that there was a suicide, as you know, was a, like pedophilia, a lot of a lot of drug addiction. These are shameful things. People hide them. You know, and um, that was in my family. You know, my brother was abused as a young youngster by by the, the help in the house, my grandfather's house. That was a secret for many years, and that came out right, later when the right. book came out. My brother, my brother came to me, so it was all connected. You see, it's all, and the the idea of healing. This is what we're talking about, isn't it? You know, like uh, the, the spirituality, the, the struggle, emotional struggle to heal yourself, right? The truth will set you free. Idea. <laughs> Right, a lot of people understandably resist this because it's it's painful. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I, my struggle hasn't been easy. I had to really work hard in my therapy to confront some very painful and difficult things. But I had some very compassionate, strong people in my corner, and I, I was able to do it. And I wasn't just sort of drugged. If I had gone to a psychiatrist at CAMH, they would have drugged me. They would have diagnosed me as bipolar, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it suppressed my story. And I wouldn't have been able to tell my story to myself or anyone else. So I really. I feel lucky that I, I, I that I followed that path, and um, um, it's sort of like I call it thera journalism. You know, <laughs> kind of, uh, it ultimately, what's the goal here? You know, that 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 uh, it's, I suppose it's challenging people to be brave. So very very, very cathartic for yourself, definitely. Okay, so totally. I think Joan has a yeah, Joan. A lot of other people. So yeah. Joan, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joan has a question. Thank okay. you, okay. Um, James. When I'm here. And, and thank you. This has been really insightful. I'll definitely have to read more about it and hopefully get, get your book. But when I'm hearing you talk about the children, you know, your, those that attended, I'm really hearing too the pressure of being a child through no fault of their home. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Is that absolutely? It, it so seems it's a, to be a huge issue about parenting and exactly. And yeah. Just by being a child, mm -hmm. they're pressured. They're the stress, that's right. the that's, um, that's expectation. Right. It had to have been that's enormous, right. even that's from right. seven. That's right. You know, you're reminding me of a another friend of mine, working class background from Cape Breton, a lovely man, brilliant, became a teacher, wonderful values. Again, I'm, I'm privileged to be his friend, far removed from Upper Canada. I still have, I have Upper Canada friends too, but I had these other wonderful influences. And he told me, very poor working class coal miner grandfather. He said when he was seven, his mother said to him, Kenny, have you thought about what you might want to be when you grow up? And he said, no, I haven't. She said, I just want you to know if you want to be a doctor or a garbage man, I'll still love you. I'll always love you. And he said that was huge. That was huge. My that the world I grew up in, you would never hear that conversation. This is the paradox because you do need to guide kids and you do need to give them expectations. You need, you need to challenge them and you give them information. But unfortunately, Upper Canada is an example of, at its worst, the pathology of it is there was no choice. You had to do this. The pressures were so implicit and explicit of maintaining the family fortune often. You had families that have been around for three or four generations and are very wealthy. And the children, the boys especially, are have to sort of manage the, the family stock portfolio, you know, hence a lot of financial services. And, and so to break away, especially back then, I think it's easier now, I hope it is, but the, all four Eaton boys, you know, you have to go into the family business, right? And some adapt to it and do well, and some crack up because like I, the reading I showed you, the guy who wanted to be an archeologist, right? And my father cracked up for this. My father cracked up for this reason. He wasn't, it didn't, raising the child to, to find out what they're, they'll tell you who they want to be if you let them, if you listen to them and let them emerge out of themselves and just support that, right? It's not easy, but you've got to do that. Rather than making them feel, you've got to be a lawyer or a doctor or that's it. <laughs> you know, they might be a born lawyer, but who knows? Right? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was going to yes. say, you also see that with the, the Austin family who owned, who lived at Spadina House. Spadina House. Yes, I know that family. The, yeah. the same, the same trend, and the yes. same family issues. That's right, 
and the shaming. You see, they, they get exactly. repeated. You see, the generations repeat them because there's no there, there's no talking about yeah. it. See, this this diffuses it by making it public. It helps people. They go, oh, right. Other people are aware of this. It's not a secret. It's not my dirty little secret. You know, and, it's, and, it, and once you once you make it just talk freely as we are here, it's a wonderful, wonderful healing thing. It's, it's pretty simple at some level, but the, the, the deep shaming is it can kill people. I mean, my grandfather killed himself when, you, when we talk about that book next time in his letters home when he's in a, when in a hospital feeling suicidal. He, think, he says, I've committed an unpardonable sin and the penalty is death. He feels terribly ashamed and guilty about something, right? And he asked to see a priest and they wouldn't give it. The psychiatrist denied him this. He was a Protestant, but he wanted to see, he wanted to confess something. Because mm -hmm. well, it's, it's cathartic, yeah. yeah. And he was denied this tragically, mm -hmm. tragically. And then he killed himself. But the, priest, so, had, the priest denied him? The, the psychiatrist wouldn't okay. let him, wouldn't let him see a priest. Wow. What a terrible thing. The, the priest, the, the psychiatrist, when you read the book, it's shocking. The book, the psychiatrist at the time hated Freud, hated Catholicism, hated communism, and hated unionism. He called them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I just, I just noticed Marianne has her, has her hand up. Marianne, yeah. are you there? Hello. Yo, Marianne. No, maybe she had her hand up and she forgot to take oh, it down. Sorry, I think my hand's just been up for the last half hour. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so, <laughs> so you know, well, James, there's, there's, you might know, you probably know this in uh, Cabbage Town, there's the home of Margaret Goodrum, goes back to 1830. Uh -huh. And uh, you, you make me think of, again, the legacy of the Goodrums in, in, in the city of Toronto. And, you know, cl clearly, I'll use that more, but I find it fascinating that you're, you're, you're part of that. And uh, yes. they, they were, they were the, uh, uh, how would you establish before the Eatons were anybody in the, in the Massey? Yes, and, yes. And, and certainly uh, you see it again. And what's fascinating the, about the Goodrums is, yes. what's remarkable about them is, they divested themselves of their fortune. Yes. Not, the Rockefellers yes. gave away half of their fortune to medical right. education, right. but the Goodrums gave it all away. <laughs> right, right. The Goodrums okay. disappeared as, as a force. So, so one thing to comment about, and I, heard, I guess I heard this from Chester Massey, Vincent Massey Tovel more so is and it must have been in the Anglicans too because I mean the reality is Methodists are just reformed Anglicans anyways I mean I've oversimplified <laughs> as a United Church minister but but he, he spoke about the Methodists giving back and the social gospel and, yes. you, and you and you see this in the city of Toronto you saw the what was it, the, the idea of Massey Hall which then was a music place for the masses uh, yes. You saw this in, in, in many places that the Massey Center for Women, Fred Victor Center. I mean, the list goes on. And now this must have echoed and, and been present within the, the idea and ethos of uh, Upper Canada College, I guess. But, but you're clearly not as much. I mean, I can't say the Methodist owned being ph philanthropic, but the, the Anglicans right. must have had that too. But, not, yes. but it was less promoted, it sounds like. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and the families are very different, right? Like, of course, yes. yes Tom, the Thompson family recently gave a hundred million dollars to right. the campaign. Right. Anonymously. Right. Anonymously. Right. Right. They didn't want to draw attention to that because they have so many problems themselves. You know. Well, so, not everybody. Not everybody wants a banner on the building. I mean, no. <laughs> that's right. But a lot do. See, that that's what's different from my grandfather's time. You see, it wasn't the Gooderum School of Public Health. Right. It was the University of Toronto School of Public Health, not right. the Rotman School of Business. It's now the Dalalana School of Public right. Health. The, the, monk, of, the, the monk School of Business, da, da, da. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So philanthropy now, I would argue, is more self-serving. It's called branding, right? You brand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's an element of self-serving. Uh, and, and also, and, and then back in the Rockefeller days, it's also guilt. It was blood money, like Rockefeller's right. money. He, he was a gangster, and he made... <laughs> He killed people, and and uh, so he, he. It's like liberal guilt. He gave away five hundred million dollars, you know, to save his soul, you know. Like, or he thought he did, <laughs> but it was. Like, but the money that was used was to towards great ends, you know. The, the public health, as someone said, is the greatest single success story of the twentieth century, that we and, forget. And, we'll and, talk about this. Next and, time, and may but. and may we guard it. Like it's our firstborn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Uh, right. in, in the spirit of Tommy Douglas, okay, definitely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he Tommy That's Douglas. He, he rise up and remind us of what we thought, the, the vision we had in mind from the beginning. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, I just know, is there any other questions for people? And um, I'm just thinking, Put would you? No? Yeah, it's about, so. Would you like to maybe? I mean, again, we could talk for hours. Uh, you're you're wonderful, fascinating, and uh, and you speak. To, I mean, history is a passion of mine, absolutely, absolutely, but. I think of, is there a closing thought you'd like to leave us with? I mean, as much as you talked about this, how can, I mean, I, I certainly, we all want to read uh, the book and, and books. Mm -hmm. and, and my hope, you know, it would be wonderful. I mean, you talked about the other book becoming a movie. I think that would be a great movie unto itself, quite honestly, because yeah. that story is repeated in British um, films and BBC, but maybe less so in American, but certainly uh, how many, BBC films have we seen about the the, the school, right? The school, That's right. The school. That's school. right. So maybe it bespeaks it's time for Canada to do the same thing, and and to share the good, the bad, the ugly, or indifferent. Yeah. That's right. As you know, we're we're characterologically just we're a different race from the Americans. We're we have yes, this history absolutely. of being self-effacing self and yes. uh, we're we're, we're like polite. We're get, polite. <laughs> yeah. Don't get too big for your britches. You know, this is what you see. My grandfather went big. You see, yeah. he was very bold. He went international. Yes. He was very entrepreneurial, but he was very ethical. Uh, you know, it was it was a very remarkable combination of things. So in some sense, it was un-Canadian, uh, but, mm -hmm. but it was public service, which was Canadian. Yes. And, and so this documentary that I'm trying to pitch to CBC will try to encapsulate this. There's a wonderful quote in um, What Disturbs by an English writer, Jan Morris, who says, it is part of the Canadian genius to reduce the heroic to the banal. Oh, which I, oh, yeah. which I think oh, is yeah. a, a lovely quote. And it took somebody outside to see that, you know. We go to we do Vimy Ridge and you know it's no big deal, you know. And and but it's a colonial mentality because we, we were always competing with as somebody said, the Canadians in World War One hated the British as much as the Germans. The British officers lording it over us, you know. So yeah, we'll, you, we'll show have, them. <laughs> have you ever listened to the the artistry of Shane Coynson, the Canadian spoken word artist? He he, he did a speak at the uh, at the Olympics, I think, in Vancouver. Uh, we are more. Are you familiar with it? No. Highly recommend it because it brings tears to your eyes because it celebrates everything we are. As Canadians, uh -huh. and it, it raises our humility to beacon status. Yes, which is which is again we're back to what you were saying. But it said yes. because I think that's what, you know we lead by that, and that's our gift, our greatest gift. Yes, yes. yes. Well, I, I mean, I wanna, they, they, yeah, sorry. I was going to say like Laurier's famous remark that the 20th century belongs to Canada. He was I think he was a century off. You know, exactly. I mean, yeah. the, the 22nd century with global warming, I mean, the, 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 we're kind of a, we're an anti-nation in some sense. And that's one of our strengths that we're not yeah. wildly nationalistic like the Americans yeah. and yeah. multicultural diversity. And so the fact that we're not being underpopulated and having this Northern expanse that as Bono says, the, can the world needs more Canada, like right. as a model, a UN model of the world will be like Canada in yes. 100 years that you yeah. hope that Canada is a beacon for that. Right. right. That's a great idea. Well, well, thank you personally, James. And I look forward to, we look forward to your next time and uh, may you continue to write. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to stop there.